welcome here to a very special Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora spotlight on the Navy midshipmen as we head into the 2024-25 college football season. I'm here with head coach Brian Newberry, and Brian has been no stranger to the show since coming to the Navy midshipmen, and I appreciate our time as always here inside of the Heritage Hill Studios. You'll find Heritage Hill on 3149 Sweet Road in Pompey, New York, in the rolling hills of upstate New York, and you'll also find them in the hustle and bustle amidst so many pieces of our city and right by the airport at 628 South Main Street in North Syracuse, so we appreciate them being our exclusive studio partner. With that being said, I defer to the other face of facial hair on the broadcast, so that's Mr. Newberry. Brian, how are we doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Now, you made a reference to my goatee when we were off the air. I've had this thing for a few years, and I absolutely had it when we met each other. Did you forget about my goatee, or did I do something to it? <laughs> no, I don't know that I forgot about it. It looked a little different earlier. I couldn't, couldn't quite tell you know, on, on the screen what's, what was going on there. I didn't see the chin part of it, so I thought maybe you're doing the handlebar thing. I was just, just curious about it. It looks good, man. Oh, yeah. No, I, uh, I can't bring myself to do some type of Hulk Hogan thing. I got to... I got to complete it here, but as I told you off the air, you know, as an ode back to Tony Stark, Iron Man, I'm pretty confident Robert Downey Jr. has a team of 10 people that are plucking each part of his face. And when you do this by yourself, I can just, uh, I just say that I, I'll know that I made it in the world when I have a team of people working on my goatee. So there you go. <laughs> So speaking of a team of people working on something together, we have an upcoming season for the Navy midshipmen. Last season, your first season as the head coach of the team, but not your first season with the team. Let's go back to that moment and going from a coordinator seat to a head coaching seat, now that you've had a season under your belt, what was that experience like for you and what have been kind of the lessons learned from coordinator to coach, head coach? Yeah, it was uh, certainly different. Um, enjoyed it. You know, you, you're doing something for the first time. It's like, you know, first time you're a coordinator. There's so many things that, uh, you know, you think you know a lot of things and then the things come across your table that, that, that you weren't quite prepared for. Um, certainly a little more comfortable now. You know, I'm a year and a half into it and, and finally feel like I can breathe a little bit. Um, in large part because I, I feel good about where our team's at, where our culture's at. Um, I feel great about our staff. The work that our players have put in, you know, back starting back in, in January. So I'm excited about where we're at. Um, learned a lot in my first year. Um, hopefully that'll help me moving into my, my second year here. And in the relationship that you had with the former head coach who brought you on to the team as a, as a coordinator on the defensive side of the ball, uh, Ken Niamatololo, what's that relationship been like? Because he had spent so many years at Navy and obviously you both work together. So is yeah. there still a back and forth between the two of you or how does that changing of the guard kind of affect the relationship or not affect sure. the relationship? Yeah, I don't, I don't think it's affected our relationship. I don't, don't see him and talk to him as much as I would, would like to, you know, we're, we're, we're both you know head coaches and both, both busy men. And, um, but we, we do share occasional text messages and things like that. Um, he's been super encouraging, you know, throughout the process. I know he's a guy that I could call and, and lean on if I needed to. Uh, but he, he's been great. I have the utmost respect for Coach Nehemiah. And, you know, certainly wouldn't have been, you know, as prepared for this this role if it wasn't for the time that I got to spend with him. There's no question about it. One of the, one of the best leaders I've ever been around and learned a ton from him, you know, in, in the four years under him. Yeah, you know, and, and spending that time, when you look at it, and you and I have kind of discussed it, I guess to a certain extent, and I've I thought about this, when you're a coordinator and your focus is in one of the three phases and you become a head coach and you're overseeing all of it, two-part question in, in the sense of how hard is it for you to let go of the defense when you mm -hmm. go from coordinator to head coach and you have to trust somebody to oversee that world? And yeah. what do you do with the other two phases to make yourself more well-rounded? Do you do you feel like when you took over at Navy, like I said, first part, what's it like to give up the defense as a coordinator? But then second part, were there things that happened throughout your time as a coach where offense and special teams, it wasn't like, oh, I'm a head coach now. Now I got to go through all of this. Did you feel like you had teachable moments where you learned about those phases before you took over as head coach? 
Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, defensively, uh, I, I thought I would be a lot more hands-on and involved uh, than I actually was. And, and the, the big reason for that is, is P.J. Volker is, is outstanding. You know, he's a phenomenal football coach. Uh, I thought he did a great job with our defense last year. Him and I have been together. Um, you know, going back to my Kennesaw State days, there's a level of trust there. There's a, a system that, you know, that we've really kind of built together. And so I have full, full trust in PJ. And so I was able to spend a little more time on offensive side of the football, you know, as well as the special teams. But I've got three coordinators in place now that, uh, that I trust entirely, feel really good about things that we're doing. Um, and so for me to, to just, get, you know, I, I love defense. I'm always going to be involved on, on that side of the football um, because I enjoy it. Uh, don't feel like I have to police it in any way, if that makes sense. Because I think PJ does a phenomenal job, but, um, but there's certainly conversations that we have about certain things and some ideas that I have, and, um, and some ideas that he comes to me with. You know, I think it's important as a coordinator to have to have some freedom in, in what you're doing. We obviously have a system, but I want PJ to be able to put his own stamp on. I think that's really important. You know, I think I've been fortunate enough. You know, my last two jobs, especially as the coordinator, were, um, you know, it, it was it was my defense. And, yeah. and I felt that, that freedom. I didn't feel like I was uh, walking on eggshells or had somebody breathing down my neck, looking over my shoulder all the time. And, and I think that, that, that gives you some uh, some creativity uh, to be able to work that way and, and know that somebody trusts you entirely. And I, I certainly do with P.J. And, you know, we, we had to change the coordinator. Um, Drew Cronick is our offensive coordinator, and he, he's, he's been outstanding. Um, in, in every way, you know, from a leadership standpoint, uh, his demeanor with our players. Uh, I love what we're doing offensively. I feel like we have an identity. Uh, and then Ricky Brown, uh, you know, is our special teams coordinator. You know, in the, the four years I was here as a defense coordinator, the special teams was kind of uh, piecemeal. You know, one guy was responsible for a kickoff return, another for punt, so on and so forth. But Ricky Brown is, is the guy that handles it all. And, and I, I like that being under one guy. You know, yeah. Our assistant coaches have their responsibilities, obviously, but, but he's done an outstanding job with that. So it, it certainly makes my job uh, a lot easier uh, in regards to the X's and O's piece when you feel like you've got three really outstanding coordinators in place, which I do. Yeah, you know, and like you said, I mean, having having those connections, you said you feel like the offense has an identity. When I got yeah. around this program over a decade ago, the identity was the triple option, and so few were – running it anymore right Paul Johnson when he was there and then he brought it to Georgia Tech and then Kenny Amatsololo sharing that with Navy over the years you said you feel like you have an identity now with this offensive coordinator change what is the identity that you would like to share with us well it's, it's similar to the identity we had and we were a triple option team we, we've got to build around the football first and foremost here uh, we, we want to possess the football uh, grind people out when the Limit other people's possessions offensively, um, and so it's, it's a different offense. Obviously, it's a wing T base. Some, you call it the millennial wing T with some triple option mixed in there. It's a pretty sophisticated pass game off of what we're doing. It just it's a system. Uh, one thing complements another, complements another, and yeah. it's what we need to do here at, at Navy to be successful. And I love the way we're doing it. I love the way it's built. Um, and it's something that's going to continue to evolve you know, based on our players and within the system. Uh, but I feel good about the pieces right now. I feel good about where we're at, you know, coming out of spring ball and the work we did here in June and our OTAs and, and the work we'll continue to do in July. Yeah, and you know, when you talk about the, the wing T and having that and obviously having – uh, that triple option piece to it still. And when we look at a wing T offense and, and what that kind of commands out of here, uh, having a multiple running back set as well as uh, utilizing play action and misdirection, where is the quarterback in this? Do you feel like there's more passing in this as much as there's misdirection, as much as there's different things with play action and whatnot in the wing T and the triple op option you know, really focusing on running the ball and, like you said, possessing the ball, condensing the clock for the other team. All of that being said, is there more passing that's coming now? Is there more of finding those people that want to join the Naval Academy that have a different maybe skill set, skill set when it comes to their arm strength and their ability either within the pocket or to be able to throw on the move? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, in the, 
the old under center triple option, double slot, the you know, focal point uh, was, was uh, and the run game was primarily on the quarterback. Um, a, a little less reads uh, in this offense with the quarterbacks. Like I said, we're going to incorporate some triple, uh, a little bit under center and some of the gun. Um, we incorporate a tight end, which we haven't done here uh, much in the past, which is, I think, it's a really important part of the offense. Um, but, yeah, I think what we're doing offensively, the two quarterbacks that are one to come out of spring, or this offense is suited more so for them than, than say, the under center, you know, uh, exclusive triple option. I think what we do out of the pass game is a little more nuanced, uh, a little more creative. Uh, we've got answers for a lot of different things. Um, so, I, you know, I, I love – we obviously have to be unique. We have to be different here at the Naval Academy. I said earlier, we've got to be able to run the football and possess the football. Um, and certainly, I don't, I don't know if anybody in the country at the FBS level is, is doing what we're doing offensively. So it's, it's going to be difficult to prepare for. Um, you know, three or four days during the week, you know, you've got to get ready for the triple and, and the wing tee and, and, and all the pass game and things that come off of that. So uh, love what we're doing. I think it suits who we are. I think it gives us the best chance to win. I think it's going to be very difficult for, for people to prepare for us in a short amount of time. Do you feel like this this evolution for you as the head coach is coming off of, okay, the triple option is such a unique thing, but coming into the American Navy was, was winning games more so and was vying for an AAC title, then the longer that they were in the league – there was some struggle there, right? There was some struggle there defensively. You were brought in as a defensive coordinator. And the triple option, the question was, like, is this a workable commodity in today's football? So is the evolution of this triple option in into more nuances and more pieces here and to the talent that you have at quarterback, like you said with a couple guys that you had, is this an evolution of necessity of saying – we can't just simply be what we were. We have to evolve a little bit. We're going to stay who we are, but we have to essentially expand out into other areas in order to be competitive inside of a conference that we see so many of these teams so often. Yeah, I think that's certainly a part of it. Um, we're always evolving in this game. I think being in the conference and seeing the same teams year in and year out, uh, people get used to seeing it a little bit. And I think in regards to recruiting, uh, it's opened some doors for us to recruit uh, players that might not have considered Naval Academy um, before this. And it's also um, you know, similar philosophy, uh, similar identity, uh, but a different system, uh, which I like. And, you know, you've got Army in our conference now. They're, they're going back under center uh, primarily. And so that's you know, one more team that would have been running that offense uh, in our conference. And so uh, I like the uniqueness of it. Um, you know, you factor in some things like the, the cut block rule, uh, which obviously affected the offense a little bit as well. Uh, the wing tee, uh, a little more gap scheme type things, a little more uh, zone scheme. Um, with all the other things that we were doing out of the triple uh, at our disposal, if that makes sense. Yeah, you know, and I think there's excitement around it. There's something I wanted to show you because the Naval Academy has always had a special meaning to me that goes far beyond football. You and I got to talk about it when we met down in Arlington last year. Mm-hmm. And this this actually sits right off camera, and I look at it the entire show. Uh, I get hard-pressed to not touch this during uh, any time I come into the studio to not touch this hat at least once in thinking about my grandfather, but this is my grandfather, Tommy Cavino, called him Papa Cavino. This is his naval hat from World War II. You can see, I don't know if you can see it here. Yeah, you can see it. But it says T.A. Cavino for Thomas Archibald Cavino. And when he passed, uh, this was the the thing that I took, you know, some stuff here, but his Navy hat from World War II sits right off the camera for me. And, awesome. you know, I, I'd love to just, you know, I've talked about it with the Naval Academy over the years and, you know, just with you, my my love and, and my passion for the Naval Academy from my grandfather and from my great uncle Carmen, who just passed away recently in his in his ni- late 90s. So he served in multiple wars. And I, I just I'd love to go there for a second because it's it's real to me. 
it's daily to me looking at this hat. So just, you know, just, just looking at this representation of him putting his life on the line for freedom and for people to be able to sleep sweetly in their own beds. I'd love to go to that background and, and just the value and the weight of what you do at the Naval Academy that's so much more than X's and O's. Well, I, I said this when I got the head coaching job and I said it when I got here. It's just to be able to coach these kind of young men uh, is a privilege. You know, you're, I've coached great young men every, everywhere I've been at every stop. We just, we have a lot more of them here, you know, and, and to be able to coach young men that love football, but also uh, see the value and, and understand it's a privilege to serve the country. Um, I, I think I've got one of the best jobs in the country, primarily because of the kind of young men that I get to coach on a daily basis. It just, it, it means a little bit more, you know, and as, as a coach, you want to make an impact. You want to pour into these players. You want to make a difference. Um, yeah. You want to help them be successful in, in, in life after football. Well, now you're you're pouring in the young men that you know are going to be leaders uh, in our military. And they're going to do phenomenal things. And so it, it just it kind of up, ups the ante a little bit. And it, it makes it feel just a little bit more important, you know, if that makes sense. But we, we do. We have great young men in our program. Uh, I love coming to work every day. Uh, I think I've got one of the best jobs in the country. And we're still truly a developmental program. There's a lot of things going on in college football that, that are difficult right now for, for coaches everywhere else, with the transfer portal and the IL and all the things that, that we're dealing with right now. And there's a lot of those things that don't don't really affect us on yeah. day to day. And, and, and I love that. Uh, I love the recruiting young man, getting here and develop him, uh, develop a relationship and, and then send them off and, and know that they're prepared uh, and going to be successful at whatever they're doing um, you know, within their service and you know, after that. So, uh, you know, you're somewhere important. Uh, you know, you, you're having an impact on young men that are, like I said, going to be leaders in our military and going to do great things in life. And, and so that's a, it's a great responsibility. It's, it's a, it's a great privilege uh, to be a part of that. Yeah. You know, and you know, Brian, for, like you said, in this world of NIL and the transfer portal and all this, it's, it's unique to the military academies, right. To, to mm -hmm. Navy, to army, to air force that you're not, living in that world right because when somebody commits to a military academy they're committing so much more than just being a, a student athlete and so uh, i feel like the purity of collegiate athletics still exists and and that these military institutions essentially you're kind of holding something in time that it's it's almost like if you're in 2024 and there's all this industrialization and all this, you know, stuff with technology, and then you go down a main street in a small town and it looks like it hasn't been touched since like 1904, mm -hmm. there's, there's something about the sanctity of college athletics is changing drastically yet here we are at the U S Naval Academy and some things aren't, happening there and it's not being affected do you feel like you've you've almost become like a time capsule or a place where people want to come and just like enjoy the sanctity and just yeah like, like the trueness of collegiate athletics i guess i think so you know i've got friends who are coaching all over the country and and um you know the, the message is kind of the same you know that the, Navy, the academy jobs have always been great jobs, Dan, but I think now people really understand why they're great jobs and the things that like, a lot of people took for granted in coaching college football are things that are, have changed. Uh, and they, they haven't changed at the academies. And, and so I think there's a great desire to coach at a place like this right now, even more so than there was in, in the past. But, um, but that's a great comparison. You do kind of feel like you're in a capsule. Obviously, there's We've got to evolve as well with the, with the times. Um, I think the portal has is, is actually been good for us. Um, obviously, we don't take players uh, in the portal. Um, we haven't lost many in the portal either, so that's a great thing. I think it's allowing us to recruit a little higher caliber coming out of high school right now because those, those guys aren't getting as many opportunities as they used to. And so I think 
you can see it in the last two recruiting classes where, where those classes are starting to look different for us and starting to recruit a player that, that we might not have been able to recruit just a few years ago. And so um, not only have things not changed um, from the purity standpoint, as you mentioned, but I think the, the, the changes in college football are actually good for us right now in the way that we're able to recruit. And, yeah. and what we're able to sell, truthfully, Dan, I mean, you sit in front of a parent and, and you talk to them about what, what the college football world looks like right now with the portal with NIO and all those things and, and what our program looks like in comparison. And, uh, you know, that's what parents want, want to hear. Yeah, you know, I think it's it's incredible. And, and kind of like outside of collegiate athletics, just the, the grander scope of things, where do you feel, and this is, this is really important to me, and, and you know this, I would think from our conversations is I just have, like I said, with my grandfather and my great uncle, I have a love for the U S Naval Academy that I feel spoiled. Like every time I get to cover Navy to me, it's, it's, it's more than that to me. It's like a badge of honor for my family, not like of it is. So Mm -hmm. when you look at the military today and you look at, you know, the U S Naval Academy as a country, Do you feel that there's a respect for the military? Is there still like, I mean, I remember growing up as a kid and, you know, you see somebody go by and, you know, like, you know, you do that or, you know, you, you see, uh, you you see, you know, a a ship out in the water and you just kind of pause and you reflect. And, you know, I mean, I've talked to people that have done a bunch of different things in their life. And at one point they were, you know, in the, in the U S Naval Academy. And they're just talking about the precision of landing a plane and all this stuff that goes into it. Do you feel like there's still that like Marvel at the U S Naval Academy and the military in general? Do we spend enough time honoring our military people or can we do better? Yeah, I think we can always do better. I think there's, I think that that reverence is is the same. Um, You know, I think, you know, people take a lot of pride in it. I, I don't know if the reverence for uh, really the appreciation and understanding um, is the same for young people, yeah. uh, you know, for the players that we re- recruit. Now, a lot, a lot of them th- there is, you know, we recruit a lot of players that have some, some military history in their family and they, um, they understand it and they appreciate it. And some just don't, don't know what they don't know, you know? And, uh, but I think there's certainly, there's still that reverence and, and respect. And, um, you know, I think the, the people we play always, always show that. Um, you know the coaches that that, the, that I talk to in our conference. And, uh, I, I do. I certainly think there's that appreciation there. Uh, there's no doubt. Yeah, you know. So looking at where we are right now in this conference, and we talk about the military academies, Navy was independent forever, right? And in college football, and Army has been independent too. Well, one of the last moves and arguably one of the biggest, if not the biggest move before Mike Oresco retired as the first commissioner of the American of over a decade is bringing in the army black Knights college football team. So now two thirds of the military academies are in the American athletic, which makes sense because when we think of America, we think of the military institutions. So my question to you is, are you mad at Mike (laughs) for bringing in army? And secondly, is are the is Air Force on alert now? Should we call the Falcons and say, "Hey, you know, you guys are next," or where are we at? I think it was something that was actually on, on the table, but no, not not mad at Mike. I think it's you know, truthfully, it's nice having our own niche in the conference, uh, but it's 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 good to have an Army in here. Uh, I think it's great for our conference, and it's probably really good for Army as well um, to keep the uh, the game the way that he's at. Is obviously my my biggest concern. And they did everything they could to, to preserve that that game um, when we play it and the magnitude of it. So, no, I'm excited about Army coming in. I don't, I don't have any problems with that. So there's a uniqueness to this because the Army-Navy game is obviously going to continue mid-December every season. It's an extra season on their schedule, an ex- extra game on their schedule, an extra game on your schedule. So you'll still continue to play 13. Here's where it gets interesting. It's not a conference game. It's just an, it's the army Navy game still, even though you're both within the conference. So the only time that you will play within conference 
when we look at this is if you both played in the American Athletic Championship game and you would essentially play back to back, you'd play in the championship game, then you would play in the Army Navy game to follow. So what are your thoughts about that dynamic of it, that the Army Navy game is not considered one of your American Athletic scheduled games and that you could see Army twice if you both are in the top two in the American? Yeah, but I think that's the only way you could you could do it. You know, I think um, in the rare occasion that we're we're both two, uh, both in the conference championship game, what a great thing that would be. But the likelihood of that happening is, is probably pretty rare. Um, but if if it did, it'd be historical. That's for sure. It'd be, be fun to play on twice. You know? Yeah, and and it's it's such a historic game. There's so much on the line, and so so much to it that it really becomes. Uh, to me, it, it's it's. I mean, it's in December. It's right around Christmas time, so it becomes one of those uh, holiday events to me. Uh, I have been known. I think the statute of limitations is over, so I can say Paramount Plus. Uh, I have been known to get the seven day free trial just for the Army Navy game and deleting it immediately after. But now, because of the other uh, streaming platforms that I have, I don't have any concern. I would think about uh, being able to watch this Army Navy game and record it and go back and see it. How important is this game to college football? We talk about the military institutions being time capsules, keeping the fabric of collegiate athletics together while the rest of the uh, college football world has been in kind of this very shaky, tumultuous state. There's Mm -hmm. been army navy and and air force holding together the ideals that i think uh, that things were built on so how important is this game to the country and to the world that it gets its own week and it always has the spotlight yeah i think it's extremely important like it it always has been maybe even more important now because of the changes in, in college football but just the uh, to maintain the history of it the tradition of it you know what what great exposure it is, you know, for, for our academies and for our players and, and for the military in general. Uh, it's, it's always been important. I think now maybe even, even more so. And so, and I think you saw that in the way that they, they maintained the spot in the game and, and uh, you know, didn't, didn't change you know, what we've been doing for, for such a long time because of the magnitude of how important that game is. So what's it going to be like for you to see Jeff Munkin at media days? Uh, you know, I, it'll be fine. I mean, it, it's always cordial. You know, I think we, you yeah. know, we, we uh, are obviously great competitors, but, but there's a mutual respect there. And, and uh, I'm sure we'll, 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 we'll have a brief conversation at some point while we're there. Uh, but, you know, I always do the media day before the Army Navy game to see him at that function as well. But, be different, but uh, always good to see him. And for you, Brian, before I let you go, uh, to take and before we jump into rapid fire here, to take a look at the leadership, Mike Oresco, commissioner of the Conference of the American, before it was even named or given a logo. I was with him back in those times. What I know that you know, you've been in this conference as a coordinator. You've been in this conference as a head coach. Now you've gotten to spend some years around, obviously, the American inside the American and gotten to know Mike Oresco. Who is he for this conference? Like, how did, what is his legacy, essentially? Mm-hmm. And then secondly, what do you think about the second commissioner ever, which is Tim Pernetti, who has now taken over? Yeah. Well, I think Mike did phenomenal things uh, for this conference. Uh, he's always super outspoken, uh, always trying to keep us in the conversation. You know, the power six, I think he coined that, that term. And, and I thought he did a phenomenal job promoting our conference and supporting the coaches within the conference. I was only been a head coach, you know, for a year with, with him being the commissioner. But uh, I think he, he's got a lot to be proud of. I think he left a tremendous legacy. And, and uh, uh, excited about Tim. Um, you know, I think he's a, he's a go-getter. I think from everything that I've read and know about him, he, he's not afraid to think outside of the box. And, uh, I think he's going to be a great representative for our, for our conference, and I'm excited to work, work with him. Do you feel like, I mean, all these years of independence and then having the difference when it comes to NIL and Transfer Portal and whatnot with the military academies, do you feel like you belong but don't? I mean, is there a sense of, yes, we're in the room, but 
this doesn't all pertain to us. I mean, in in your kind of getting the sense of it from the head coach's seat now, does it feel like Navy it fully is is in the American when it comes to college football? Fully is a part of it, or do you kind of feel like you're sitting in a cafeteria where your table's different from the other tables? Like, what's kind of yeah. the dynamic of that? Yeah, I think it's I think it's both. I think it's a really good question. It's interesting because you sit in on these these head coaching calls and. You know, a lot of the topics, a lot of the conversation um, doesn't affect us in the way that it does the others. You know, certain things that we're having to troubleshoot and think through and have discussions about, you know, I'm just I'm just a fly on the wall and, and I'm listening. Certain things obviously pertain to us and um, and the success of our conference and what we're doing as a conference is really, really important uh, to me, obviously. But no, I certainly feel like we have a seat at the table, um, but sometimes – you know, that, that seat isn't relative, uh, isn't important relative to all the conversations that, that we may be having, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Final piece here with Brian Newberry in this preview of the 2024-25 season with the Navy Midshipmen, head football coach in our coverage of the American Athletic Conference and college football in general here on Wake Up Call with Dan Tortora inside of the Heritage Hill Studios. Brian, you get asked questions all the time. You have the opportunity to flip the script. You could put me on the hot seat. Whenever you're ready, go ahead. Shoot on the hot seat. Yes, sir. Um, who do you think is going to win the national championship this year? Oh, boy. Goodness me. I, I just <laughs> – I, I feel maybe <laughs> better about Alabama than some people do with Kalen DeBoer, but I feel good about them still. I – Obviously, got to talk to him when he was at Washington. I I would say Georgia. I feel good about. I would say there there's there's certain teams in the SEC. It's going to be interesting to see what Clemson looks like this year. I think Mike Norvell, who was in the American for four years as the head coach of Memphis, and I was with him the whole time. I told Florida State fans when they got Mike Norvell to understand that they need to just kind of shush and let him go and that in a few years he'd have them in a good place, and he does. So, you know, I'm going to dark horse Florida State. I'm going to low-key say don't count out Alabama, and I'm going to feel good about Georgia, but I think there's another sneaky team in the SEC that might find its way out of there. I feel like you kind of have to have a watchful eye on Brian Kelly and LSU and, and some of the teams out there. I, I don't think that it, this is a done deal this year. I don't think that this is an easy one this year. The, the transfer portal makes things a lot different year to year, right? Just the, oh, yeah. the, the drastic changes. And Do you want to good. say hi to coach? This is my dog, Lily. <laughs> so, hey, buddy. This is Lily. Those look like a smart dog. Yeah. yeah. She's a good one. <laughs> but yeah, she, uh, not liking the storm right now. My question back to you, Brian, is I want to go to food here for a second. What What is the, for you, the one thing food-wise that you can't live without? And then what's that one thing that your family made growing up that you didn't have the heart to tell your mom or your dad, like, please stop making that? <laughs> <laughs> to your second question, it was probably you know, my mom's up. Uh, pork chops which my dad loved but um you know i don't love pork chops it's they're they're not very tender uh, yeah. my mom had a tendency to overcook those things when i was a kid they, they were a little bit more like jerky you know uh, but i ate it uh, nonetheless yeah. there's some good things that she made along with it and i think uh, the one food right now that you know i never uh, really enjoyed before i got to annapolis is is oysters okay uh, and i find myself craving those a lot in the last uh, year or so. So kind of developing the taste and the appreciation for those that I, that I never had, you know, growing up, obviously living in Oklahoma. So I know when I come to visit you with, in Annapolis that, that I know I'm going to be eating some, some high-class stuff, I guess. Yeah, I know a couple of good spots. Okay. What's your second question for me? Uh, if you're going back to high school, you're, you're a high school senior, you're playing, playing football, uh, and you, you can go anywhere in the country. Uh, what what college are you going to play at? What position are you playing? Oh man, 
Well, if I'm still the same height, if I'm five eight, like I like throwing the ball, but I'm probably I'm, pl- I'm probably playing running back or DB, and I I love running back, which is not a tough sell at at Navy. So I would say this: my hometown of Syracuse, I'd be hard pressed to say no to them, depending on the coach. And but I I will also say, and I'm not saying this because you're on the air, if you came to visit me and my parents and you sat with my mom in the house that she took over after my grandmother passed away. That's the house that my grandfather and my grandmother raised her in. And you talked to her about Navy and the values and all that stuff and what can come with that and all those things. And people know the type of man I am with God and family and values and and morals and all that. I think that I think Brian Newberry would definitely have a place in the conversation. Nice. That's what that's what I wanted to hear. That's where I was going. <laughs> I think you'd have a place in the conversation. Now I know the question yeah. that Coach Munkin's going to ask me, but you know. So sure. my question back to you is uh, is for me, Coach. Uh, you know this this is this is a world that has been uh, deeply changed, not in the best of ways, from when I was a little kid. What's the one thing that you would love to see us return to more than anything else? You know, I, I think there's there's so much division in, the, in this country right now, and, and uh, mainly because of, of, of the politics and everything that's going on. You know, it's, it's almost like uh, there's two entirely different sides, and, and that's that's disturbing. Yeah. Um, I didn't feel like it used to be that way uh, in politics, which, which trickles down to everything else in our society. Obviously, it's just way too much division uh, within our country right now. I'd love to see us back to being a, a country that's proud of, of where the president might be, whether we agree with everything or we don't. Um, so just off the top of my head, I think that's the one thing that's disturbing. You know, I don't I, I watch enough of the news to be informed, uh, but I don't make a habit of watching it. It's hard to stomach, you know, some of the things that, that you see on TV nowadays. Um, so yeah, that'd be a, a one thing right now, just off the top of my head. Well, I don't know any better way to end this conversation than to say uh, to end the division that we have in this country and to bring people together. And you said it perfectly. You watch enough to be informed, but not too much because it does turn your stomach. I think a lot of people equal those sentiments. And I think looking back to and putting a focus on the uh, military academies and getting to know, you know, what you do at Navy and what goes uh, far beyond, I think that those things could always be helpful in helping to bring people back to who we are as America. Uh, At least for me, when I think about who we are as a country, I think if you go if you go and put a focus on the military academies and I have family that has served in the Army, the Navy, as well as the Air Force, I think if there was a focus and a spotlight there, it would be hard to forget who we are. I think it would be easy to remember. And uh, Proud to Be an American is one of my favorite songs, and it brings me to uh, the military focus, and it brings me to uh, who we are and and who we've been commanded to be uh, greater than self, essentially and to keep God at the forefront. So, Brian, you know I care about football, and you know I care about your team's success, but you also know that more than anything else, I care about the what you stand for at the U.S. Naval Academy, and I care about the ideals, the principles, and what you're trying to do to be a beacon of light, not just to the United States of America, but to the entire world all across the globe. So I could say thank you. I don't think those words are enough. I appreciate your friendship. I look forward to seeing you face to face, but you know, every time we get to talk, it's really hard for me to say, see you later because I always have so many things to pick your brain about. And above all of them is a tremendous gratitude for you representing an Academy that I love and that my family deeply appreciates. Thank you. I really appreciate that. So I'm, I'm, I'm lucky and fortunate to be here. There's no doubt about that. Appreciate you, Dan, for what you do and, and uh, more importantly, how you do it. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. No, I will.